Mia? Mo. Oh, Mo. Mo. Isn't there an umlaut or something? Something, but mm. it, it's the me. 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 Hello, maniacs. Hey, me. <laughs> you can't really switch it up. It's hey, maniacs. Hello, maniacs. Hi, maniacs. Yep. Give them a second to say hi back. Sup, maniacs. Yo. Yo, maniacs. <laughs> Bonjour, maniac. <laughs> oh, now you're getting fancy. <laughs> Guten Tag, maniac. <laughs> My German Southern accent. Midsummer Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week we dig into the episodes of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. If you uh, let your kids watch shows where there's some maybe flooding, sort of, kind of, they can listen to the podcast. I guess. Nothing too adult in this episode, especially. No. I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. And this is Midsummer Maniacs. We're talking about season 16, episode two, Let Us Pray. Let Us Pray. P-R-E-Y, get it? Get it? Get it's it? a pun. Get it? Get it? Get it? Yeah. Get it? You got it. Get it, yeah. You got stuff to talk about before we dive I in. I do. Now. First of all, we have a newsletter now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the new Midsummer Maniacs newsletter is going to start on the 1st of September. It's going to come out on the first Wednesday of every month. Only one a month. Only one a month. We're not going to fill your inbox with things. Gee, Mark, if I'm interested in signing up for the Midsummer Maniacs newsletter, how can I do so? You go to midsummermaniacs.transformer.fm mm -hmm. and you go to the bottom of the page and you put in your email address and then we take all your credit card information. No, and all, no, no. Oh, just your email address. And you can your... unsubscribe at any time. But it will be jam-packed full with fun info and news and announcements and insider info and stuff that you only get there first. And we're never going to charge for it. It's and, never going to be a revenue generating And we're thing. never, ever going to share your email address never, with anyone. ever. No matter how much they try to torture us. Not, I wouldn't even give our email those email addresses to our children. Even if they put a burlap sack on my head and nope. lace it up and nope. then tie it in a fancy knot. Nope. I'm not going to tell. Nope. Nope. Those email addresses are safe. That's right. Safe and sound. We had 100,000 downloads. Whoop, whoop. That's insane. I knew we would hit it just before the other episode dropped. But just uh, once again, thank you for all the love that you've shown us from the very beginning. There are people that have been with us from the very first week. I'm just so glad that people find it interesting and fun because... It, now more than ever, it's, I keep thinking that we're going to say, oh, now that that's over, you know, isn't it fun that we can just have, you know, a good time together? But it's like now more than ever, everybody needs a little bit of sunshine. And I hope that we provide a little bit. That would be good. It's no sunshine this episode. Rainy rain rain of rain town. Yes. <laughs> Flood rain. So I have a story to tell you that oh. I think our listeners will relate to. Okay. Okay. So I had this meeting at work. Yes. And part of this meeting at work was a little... We should get to know each other better kind of deal, right? And so we had to do a little like a slide of a PowerPoint that had some pictures of things. Yes, I had, that were related I had to, to do us. This, this week. <laughs> yes. And one of the questions that we were supposed to have a picture to answer was if money wasn't an issue, what what dream job would you have? And I put a picture of a mic and a headset there because I like doing this podcast with you. I had Absolutely. a lot of fun doing it with you. And yeah. if I didn't have to work we would do a lot more, I think. We would still do the podcast, that's for sure. We always have fun. Yeah. Uh, and so I explained that. And then later, somebody came to me and said, what's this podcast that you do? And I said, well, it's a recap podcast about this British murder mystery show. I usually say that you've never heard of before. That you've probably never heard of, but you know, we really like it. And there's lots of people who like it. It's been around for a long time. Oh, what's it called? Midsummer Murders. And then this person said, oh, I I've seen that show. Oh. I like that show. Okay. Quietly, right? Oh, like... Like it was a secret. Who could hear. Like nobody can know. There's millions of people watch this show. <laughs> What's the name of the podcast? And so I told the person, they were like, I'll give it a listen. Good. And I was like, is it a secret that you like this show? Like, if other people find out, would that be a bad thing? <laughs> no, no, it's not like that. It's just, um, you know, it's just not something that you talk about. Like, what? <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> like, okay, we're doing a service. If for no other reason than the closet midsummer people can come out and say, I like midsummer. <laughs> we have. And it's it, okay. If you took all of our videos and audio all added together, mm -hmm. we have five days of straight talking about midsummer. Yes. We are out of the closet yes. midsummer people. <laughs> I just, I just love the. Psst, oh, don't tell anybody, but I like don't tell. summer. No, like, of course you do, cause it's awesome. Man, okay. The, What's wrong with you? The best thing, first of all, say it loud and proud. I love the minutes midsummer. Mm -hmm. I love midsummer. Say that loud and proud. Second of all, you might uh, go get some merch from Midsummer Maniacs and say that loud and proud. Just so you can show off the fact that you like it. Yeah. Somebody's gonna go. Oh, I like that show too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're in Germany. She, yeah. She's either in Wisconsin or Germany. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anyhow, I thought that was funny. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let us pray. Okay. Filmed in April and May 2013. Broadcast date, the 8th of January 2014. 6.06 .06 million viewers. Directed by Alex Pillai. P-I-L-A-I. -I, mm -hmm. Pillai. I think so. And Paul Logue wrote it. Oh. We're in Midsummer St. Clair. We ain't ever been here before. No, they're at the point now where they're just making villages up. Yeah. Because if they went back to Badger's Drift again, you know, like you just can't go back to some of those places. Like, oh, this is the place where all those people were murdered and now we're back. Yes. So the conceit doesn't quite work anymore. You can only have so many people die in a village <laughs> before everybody moves out. Did you know that Anglican churches have a special soul-sucking tubing? No. Okay, because at, at first I was like, that's a lot of yellow tubing going in the church there. Mm -hmm. I was like, are they sucking souls out of the ground? No, or? it's flooded. I know. Duh. I know that now. But, <laughs> but it runs like right down the center of the church. <laughs> Because there's a fresco in the well, basement, well, right? Frank, that they only find because a wall collapses we, because of the flooding. Yes. The, so the wall collapses because of the flooding. I think it's probably Frank. I have a problem with Frank as a builder. Okay. Because first of all, his place is a junkyard, not a builder's place. Right. Plus, he never builds anything in no, this episode. No, no. They look more like removal guys and junkyard guys than they do builders. He does better at auto uh, theft than he does. Well, kind of. No. No, he doesn't. Because it dies on him and he no. accidentally puts yeah. it in a ditch. Okay. Yeah. He's okay. not even good at that. It's bad at everything. Okay. <laughs> Did you think when they revealed the fresco, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you this because I, 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 didn't, I didn't prep you for this. I think that Jesus in the fresco looks a little bit like Charlie. Mm, like Nelson? Yeah. I didn't see that. Oh, okay. But I can understand why you say it. So they find this fresco. Would they not know that there was that in the bottom of the church? Like that there was other areas in the bottom of the church? Well, there's clearly like catacombs underneath there. There's brick arches underneath yeah. the church. So they must have been aware that there was a space down there. But then this wall falls over and it reveals a space they didn't know was there. But it's there. like the tomb of Tutankhamun in there. <laughs> like it's huge. Like I don't know why anybody would have painted a fresco in the basement. Why it's not as the, if it was a secret. Why is the fresco in the basement? And then I literally spent easily an hour trying to figure out how to move a fresco. <laughs> There's a method. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely delicate, but yeah. it's possible. Yeah. I mean, the Last Supper was moved. Yes. I My only explanation... That would make it sort of realistic that there's a fresco in these catacombs is if it's actually a Catholic fresco. Okay. So maybe this chapel used to be a small Catholic church. And then during the Reformation, they kicked the Catholics over. out and then the, yeah, the Anglicans took it over and they didn't know that the Catholics had a hidden painting in the basement that they had put there so they could have services in secret. I could buy that because it's a pretty Catholic kind of inquisition-y fresco too. Yeah, but the church looks like a typical village chapel. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and if, you know, if you're Catholic and you're on the run and you're going to put together kind of an ad hoc worship space, is that what you would paint on the wall? No. Tortures? Maybe they wanted to torture the people that were chasing them, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> We just sit here and imagine torturing Anglicans. We want Henry VIII to be put on the rack. I think they were more scared of the Anglicans than hated them. Yeah, yeah. 
I, they had reason to be scared of them. So six, then, six months later, one eternity later, Kate's house is messy. Did you know that Kate's house is messy? I think you are a scientist. I think it's a funny conceit that Charlie and Kate both want to talk to John about the other. And he says, I don't care. I don't care. It's almost like they're dating. Yeah. But they're not. But I think it's funny. It fills in the space in a way that doesn't feel so poppery. Yeah. More upsetting to me than the torture and the burlap and the other murders in this episode, the thing that upset me most is Sarah throwing packing peanuts on the floor. What is she doing? She's unpacking baby Somebody's stuff. Somebody is just going to have to pick up the With wild things. abandon. Just flinging them everywhere. The dog's going to get into them. Dog's going to eat them, get sick. I was like, uh-uh. Who just throws them on the floor? Yeah. Apparently, Kate. Maybe <laughs> Kate and Sarah need to live together. Charlie doesn't really describe what is so wrong with Kate's house, other than it's extremely messy and he doesn't know where to start. But we don't know if it's like dirty dishes everywhere or if she puts her dirty underwear on the living room floor. I think it's kind of up to everything. Everything. Because he's like, you're a scientist. You should know how bad this is. So it's not just clutter. No, no. It's like unhealthily messy. (laughs) The other thing that I'm really... But I like that. I like that Kate is secretly messy. I think that's great. The other thing that I do like about the baby stuff is we don't have a baby shower episode where Barnaby is doing the, I need to get to the baby shower, but I've figured out who the murderer is. Yeah. There's none of that. I've got to go pick up the wedding invitations. Yeah. Or the run of show or whatever And it's it not is. that that's a bad thing. <laughs> no, but, but it's been done. It's been, especially in Midsummer. Yeah. It's been done quite a bit. Yeah. And and that was that was the other Barnaby. What do you think about Barnaby's total lack of knowledge of children at this point? Now, I do realize he has a psychology degree. (laughs) I think it's completely realistic that a man of his age probably would have assumed that at that age, he was probably not going to have kids and has never particularly been interested in them. No. And I think... And I think that's totally fine. Babies, first babies especially... And, you know, Sarah and I were not married when she had the triplets, so I don't know what this process was like for you. But you always underestimate babies. Not only were we not married, we didn't know each other. Yes. I don't want people to think that, like, you got me pregnant with triplets but hadn't married me. No, I would have married you. (laughs) Okay. We were in different relationships when the kids were born. This is the scintillating details you'll get in the (laughs) newsletter, man. It's true. You have no idea just how much stuff babies not need, but require. The stuff that they require is a lot. But then on top of that, you're convinced to buy a whole bunch of crap they really don't need. Now multiply that times three. Because because that's what I One of the things I said in my first marriage when Jack was born was that babies add one plus one and a half bags to every trip. Yes, at least. And how was it with triplets? Uh, six bags oh, Jesus. of stuff to every trip. Oh. Just imagine finding room for three high chairs in your kitchen. Yeah. Three high chairs, three... Three car seats. Car seats. Three bouncy the seats. Pram, the three whole Three cradles. Yep. Three beds. Mm. Three everything. Yeah. Now it's three college degrees. Yeah. Ugh. Baby, babies have a lot of stuff. I'm glad that Sarah is excited about it. I think it wouldn't have killed them to make him a bit more excited. But I also understand that he has, he still has time to get excited. He's allowed think, to be a little concerned and I worried think the and scene afraid. With the picture and him and yeah. telling the story with his dad yeah. is a, a realistic thing that happens that is really nice. Yeah. I thought that was nice. Zoom. Meanwhile, Zoom. There's a body in the weir. Zoom. That's the boat going back and forth by the weir. The rescue boats. Oh my gosh. What where are those cops going in that boat so fast? They're, back and forth. They're and trying bro- to make sure that their motors chop up any evidence mm-hmm. that might be floating in the water. Mm-hmm. Meow, mm-hmm. Meow. <laughs> they're just like, can I have a turn? Can I go first? <laughs> that burlap sack creeps me out. That is a weird thing. But more weird than that is why a homeless shelter would have its own burlap sacks branded. Yeah. And we'll get to that. <laughs> we have a whole situation. But. but but the burlap sack on her head, like with the lacing and everything, it 
it's, it's very scarecrow. Yes. And and very medieval torture. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And it looks intentionally made. Yeah. Like this is a hood to go on somebody's head. You know, our 80-year-old killer took a long time putting the laces on the back of her head after killing her. No, she mm-hmm. wasn't dead yet. So he prepared that hood. He had to use a, a, an eyelet maker to punch those holes and put the oglets in for the... Not an oglet. Oglet's what's on the end of the laces. Yeah. What are they called? Eyelet. Yeah, the eyelets in for the cord to go through so it didn't just rip through burlap because it would, it just tears right through it if you pull it That's a definite midsummer cosplay costume, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Athleisure wear and a burlap hood, you're yeah. set for yep. the midsummer <laughs> Halloween party. <laughs> that's all you need. Much easier than going to the party with a chandelier stuck in you. I mean, yes, that's a, that's that's a tougher true. one to pull off. That's true. You can so probably the, see through the burlap, so, so it would be itchy on your face. So there, this is Nancy, mm-hmm. who was apparently a bit of a goer. Mm-hmm. And she's discovered by two river workers, Ava yep. and her hopefully boyfriend. Zach. Zach. Zach Lime. Guys, come on. Lime? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Played um, by Doc Brown, who used to be Ben Bailey Smith yes. and now goes by Doc Brown. Yes. He, when he was on Taskmaster, he was hilarious. He was. He, he was, was very fantastic. Good. So, Doc Brown's you, his rapper name. If you haven't watched Taskmaster, you should too. We've mentioned it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Then they go. They go. He's about to ask Ava out, and she yeah. finds a dead friend. I'm like, whoa. He's like, hey, would you like to go out sometime? She's like, body, dead body, body. It's a dead body, murder, murder. Oh, no, it is my friend. He's like, never mind. <laughs> I'll try again later. We'll I guess that's a late. no. I guess that's a no. And then they go see her husband, who she's estranged from. So Nancy, who we are reminded yet again, is a bit of a goer. Yes. Is shacked up with an art historian. Professor Philip Hamilton. He yes. prefers to be Professor Hamilton. Where's he a professor at that he can just leave for six months and hang out in a basement? I don't know. Not even tenured people can do that. It's not even time teamy. Willy nilly. No. You can't just do that. No. He sets up he sets up a lab in the absolute worst place to set up a lab ever. Yeah, in the basement. Yes. In the catacombs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me put my iMac down there. It's great. It's a perfect environment for a computer. I literally was like, that is the worst place for a computer and a microscope. We're such nerds. But I I think Michael Dewar may be my favorite character in this, her it, husband. He does such a great <laughs> job at appearing vacantly stupid. It is amazing. I don't think he ever completely closes his mouth. It's always kind of oh, hanging open. I were home. And they're like, we're sorry to tell you your wife is dead. And he's like, were it an accident? I we're, read an I read an interview. We're separated, but not serious. No, she's, nothing serious. She just gets bored. She'll come back. Um, I read an interview uh, with William Beck, who played him, and he said Michael is given a shambolic look. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, instead of disrobing, he accumulates more clothes as the alcohol has a trickle down effect on his wardrobe. <laughs> and I thought that's true. And I kind of fast forwarded through the episode again. And he does have more clothing on every time you see him. He has the same clothes on plus another layer every time you see him. I'm going to say this. (laughs) This character, Michael Dewar, his stupidity and his alcoholism save his life. Yes, they do. (laughs) They're the perfect alibi. I are too dumb to have killed my wife. Like, okay, I'm just going to go to work. No. I were at the rehab. Yeah. Well, but only for a few minutes, then I ran away. Okay. Like, how bad do you have it, man? <laughs> wow. <laughs> he just sits down on the tractor and looks sad. Oh. Not crying, not shocked, not tragic, just, oh. Oh. <laughs> Work an accident? So next we have Ewan Evans. Ewan Evans. Mm-hmm. And he has a store. Mm-hmm. And he is really proud of this store. Mm-hmm. And it only shall sell stuff that have no brand names on it. No. So it's fruit and veg, and that's it. <laughs> it's the typical Main Street post office grocery store. It's got to be so overpriced. Everything's got to be expensive. You know it's got to be expensive in there. And his son is majoring in sarcasm. And pouty stomp-offishness. Yes. 
Oh, oh, oh. I have a messenger bag. I'm out of here. Oh, oh. I'm going to art school. Oh. <laughs> I love that you and ha- hides from Victor and Stella. He can't hide from them in his own store. Like they see him run. We and- are here on official flood business. Official flood business. He leaves the front door of the store open, yeah. runs in and pretends to be doing something. Like they see you. You're the worst at hide and go seek. And <laughs> You're the- not getting away. And Victor and Stella, though old and busybodies, are really trying to help people. Yes. The infirm, the children, and the short, especially in Stella's case. Victor and Stella are the geriatric flood patrol. Yes. <laughs> Which has to be part of the name of the episode. I don't I don't know why it's their job to do it, but I'm, I guess it's a good thing that they have. Do you think there's a warehouse that makes those siglets that they have on? The tabards? Yeah. Yeah. I think you can get a tabard that says whatever you want. Well, I know that, but like they seem to be pretty flood dependent ones. (laughs) They just have flood patrol printed on them. Flood patrol. (laughs) So while we're talking about flood patrol. It needs to have like like um, 1941 military do 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 do. It's flood patrol. You think they should have pith helmets on with their wellies? Yep. They are very much a dad's army kind of group. It is kind of a dad's army thing. So there's a secret about the geriatric flood patrol in this episode. Okay. Behind the scenes, there is a secret club. Okay. What is the secret club behind the scenes? They, there are five people in this episode who are part of the flood patrol in one way or the other. Okay. Who have all been in two other episodes of Midsummer, the flying club And the Dagger Club. It's the Club Club. They are the Background Actors Club. 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 (laughs) They're all men. But not the Club Club. They're all men over 60. Only Dagger Club. Dagger and Flying. And Flying Club. And Flood. And we haven't, Dagger, Dagger Flying Flood. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen any of those episodes yet. They're all coming. In this episode, John Duggan plays a flood volunteer. Giochino Jim Cufaro can only imagine with a name like Gioncino, he's Italian. You think? Plays a flood volunteer. Flood volunteer, okay. John W.G. Harley. Yes. Can you guess what he plays? Flood volunteer. Yep. John Neville. Okay, first of all. John Neville's flood volunteer on a bike. When I saw that in the (laughs) listing, I was like, it's not John Neville. It's not X-Files, Baron Munchausen, John Neville. That's a completely different John Neville. Okay, that's a nerd joke. I, I know... I think I know what actor you're talking about, but no, no. It's not if him. you saw him, you would know John Neville. Right and away. so he he's flood volunteer on a bike. Okay. And then there's Andrew Parker, who's a flood warden. Oh. Oh, but you got paid a little bit extra Woo. for that non-speaking background part. Flood warden. I just love that there's like a little reunion behind the scenes of these five guys who are like, hey, yeah. hey, it's you again. All right. Well, this is the first time, though. Yeah. So, but later on, they're like, we'll have to talk about hey, it. Hey, we're Dagger the old guys club. at the flying club. Hey. <laughs> it's the club club guys. Yeah. Yes. I just love that there's a posse of extras, old men who are extras. Yes. <laughs> In midsummer. You want to talk we, about Martha? We meet Martha. The Reverend Martha. Hillcott. Lover, hater. It's Rebecca Front. First she of all, is Rebecca so good Front at this. is fantastic in yes. everything she does. And she just eats up the scenery in this episode. Just, ah, rah, 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 rah. Rebecca Front is so good at these kinds of roles, at the lover, hater kind of roles. Yes. She plays an MP in Thick of It, and she's just brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> she, is, she is a comedic actress that is. <laughs> Beyond compare. And in she, this, you're like, oh, I just want to slap you. Yeah. But you're kind of awesome because I want to slap you. Like, keep doing what you're doing because I like hating you. <laughs> People die. Oh, that's a nuisance. And we need money. And like, her priorities are so wackadoodle. Yep. You never see her comforting anybody. You never see her actually Whoa, like, okay. like being a minister to anyone who okay. needs it. Okay, so Charlie goes into church and says it gives him creeps. And then she goes on this 1984 diatribe oh. about wh- how God is like the Stasi. Yeah. I'm like, 
Wow. Which is the East German police, by the way. Yeah. Like every thought and deed is written down when you're in here. Yeah, that's why it gives me the creeps. <laughs> Never mind that you're just hanging out in the basement with the hunky professor all the time. Do you think later on, and we can talk about this now or later on, that when she does the champagne scene with him, she's begging for some smoochies? Yeah, but I think she accepts that it's not going to happen. Do you think she knows he's gay there? No. Okay. But he absolutely has her number. Oh, he does. I she, lo- the- she pesters him. She's annoying. She's like, can't you get things done quicker? Yeah. He slams a door in her face. Like, yeah. it, he's not taking any of her crap. He knows exactly what she's after, that she wants him to secure the, fa- the fresco so it can be restored so the church can make money from tourists coming to see it. My favorite midsummery part of this episode is when they basically teach Charlie that news travels fast in a small yeah. town. <laughs> How do you know she's dead? Um, yeah, you're from the big city, aren't you? Everybody knows. Because everybody knows already? Because the postman and the milkman probably went around telling everybody <laughs> yes. already. Meanwhile, Hamilton, handsome professor. Yes. Rugged. In his lab. Cashmere sweater, bright blue eyes, is looking forlorn. Yes, he is. In his basement laboratory. Yes, and Noah comes in and says, do you want these backed up? Which is, I guess Noah's taking pictures of the fresco. He's always got the camera. Yeah. And then he says he's going to stop the rot. And then he says, do you hear what he said there? Intonaco. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, that's the top layer of plaster. Yes. Do you want to know about how frescoes are made? Yes. Please tell me how frescoes are I made. I even practiced saying some of these words. Uh, excellent. Was cartoony one of them? Yeah. Yeah. That's the sketch. I know. Isn't that neat? That it's called a cartoon? Yeah, but I already knew that. I didn't. <laughs> And I suppose that should be left. A cartoon at. is just a term for line art mm. of any sort, right? Okay, so here's how a fresco is made and okay. why this one is in such trouble. Okay. And why you should be way more impressed with frescoes than you might already be. Yes. So frescoes are three layers of plaster. Okay. The first layer is called, I'm going to do this, Trulisatio. Oh. Okay, that's, that's right. the scratch layer. It's rough. It's got more sand in it. And that goes on the wall, right? So and, I have a brick wall and I want to put a fresco on it. Right. Put that stuff the on it. The Trulisatio is kind of like stucco. Yes. Okay? Okay. You smooth it on as much as you can. You let it dry. It takes a while. Is that the stucco sound? Yep. Yep. Okay. The second layer. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> you can do this. I wrote the phonetic pronunciation yeah, down. This is but, all Italian. But, but there's a rolling R here. Yep. Arricciato. Yes. Is the second layer. And it's a more refined plaster. You put that on, you let that dry. Now you have a smooth surface, yes. right? Then the third layer is called intonaco. Okay. Or intonacho, but not nachos. Not like no. that. Intonacho. And that's the final layer. And this is where it gets super impressive, okay? okay? So they put the plaster on, but they have to paint it while it's wet. Wow. And it dries pretty quickly. So do you put like sections on? Yes, but you have to plan where those seams are going to be because you have to hide them. Yeah. Because you can't plaster over the edge of the previous panel that you've done, right? This has convinced me not to put a fresco in her bedroom. So much so that there is a word for it. It's giornate, which is how much you can paint in a day. Basically, how much you can paint while the plaster's wet. So it takes a day to dry. So it's No, no, no. You have less than a day to paint on it before okay. it's too dry to paint on. Yeah. And so in in like places like Milan and Florence where there are a lot of frescoes, it was kind of competitive about how big your giornate was. Oh. Like, okay. oh, yours is like five by eight feet and mine's only like two by three feet because oh. I'm slower. Okay. Right? And so I have to do smaller parts. So the reason why you have to paint it while it's wet is that you water down your paint, you paint on it, and then the paint goes into the plaster and it becomes part of the plaster. And that's why they can last so long. Yes. But it also means you cannot make a mistake. No. Because you can't paint over it. No. You have to plaster over it. Oh, jeez. Which means now you've got to wait for it to dry, sand that part down so that it's lower than the rest of the intonaco, and then put more plaster in that spot without going over the edges of it 
to make it level and paint on that part while it's still wet. Wow. It's really hard to do. That's amazing. And then the details are added when it's dry. Okay. Right? So it's like a an egg white paint or like a gesso or something like that. But that's why when we see these really old frescoes, they're lacking so much of the detail because the fine details were done in a layer on top of it that wasn't really embedded in the plaster. Oh. And so they, they're the first to fall off and wear yeah. away and fade, right? Yeah. So I looked into some This recent- is no way to keep a painting, by the way. No. And, and, and a fresco done that way is called bon. It means true. That's okay. a real fresco. Okay. There are fake fresco people okay. that paint with tinted plaster. They paint on top of the plaster and then pretend that it's in it. I mean, all kinds of little things that they can do, but... It's bon. It must be so hard to figure out fakes from real. No, not if there's any damage to it. Okay. If there's any damage, you can look right at it and go, yeah. huh, that's interesting. That's Here's gross. a layer of paint on top of plaster instead of plaster that has paint embedded into it. So I looked to see if there were any um, frescoes recently discovered. Yes. And I found a few that I thought were interesting. Okay. Just in April of this year, just a few months ago, they found two Medici frescoes wow. in the Ufu... You, uh, I can't say it. I'm going to say it wrong. The Uffizi Art Museum in Florence, which was all funded by the Medici family. Okay. Way they, back when. They found them in the building they've been in for hundreds of years? Yes. Okay. They were doing some renovations to put in a new ticket booth and found two Medici portraits that wow. were frescoes underneath plaster that had been put on top of them. Oh, my gosh. In December of last year in Pompeii. Okay. They found some frescoes that were part of a... Why did I put so many tricky words in my notes? I don't know. Thermopilium, which is the Pompeii version of a fast food restaurant. Okay. Right? It's like this U-shaped counter that has all these little wells in it, and they would put food in the wells, and they had fire underneath them, and it kept them warm. Oh, that sounds fun. And it has, like, chickens and pigs and snails and... Except for the dying by Vesuvius, it sounds like a fun thing. But it was like yellow and orange. It looks like a fast food restaurant. Yep. But the funny thing is that the note for the the Pompeii sort of tour, that when they announced that they had found this and they'd restored it, it's open to the public for viewings only. Not for foods. Right. They're not going to serve food there. (laughs) Of course not. Like they have to say that. (laughs) Can we have some? (laughs) In November of 2018 in Pompeii, they found a fresco that is of Leda and the Swan. Mm -hmm. It is the only known depiction of Leda and the Swan where they're actually in the act. Whoa. It's hardcore. Wow. And she's looking at you. She's looking straight out from the wall. It's disturbing. (laughs) It's it's brought to you by the anti-swan movement. Yes. (laughs) And right now, the English Heritage Society, who maintains 87 frescoes in the UK, are having a fundraising drive. It's called Save Our Wall Paintings. Okay. So if you're interested, you can look it up on the English Heritage site. I will put a a link in the show notes. Yeah, they've got a list of all of them that that they've preserved around the country. And they're really, it's really cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, poor Lita. So it's all around the country, but not the whole county. Because that's where Nancy is a nurse. (laughs) The entire county, sometimes she has to stay overnight when she's on the far side of the county. You know, traveling nurses, more power to them. If you're a county nurse and you got to work out of your car all day, going door to door to these old folks who need help, like dressing wounds and stuff. And you can't handle the 50 minute drive home. (laughs) I understand. After a big day. Yeah. If you just got to go back to the same spot the next day in the morning. Yeah. You crash somewhere. You go to a hotel. And this is where Charlie, who wanders around and finds the fresco, Mm -hmm. finds out that the painting is being imitated. Yeah. That Nancy's death with the burlap bag is depicted in the fresco. Yes. Now, okay, I have a question for you. Mm. Our killer is the retired vicar whose name is... Reverend Arthur Gould. Yes. Do you think Reverend Gould went to see the fresco to get the ideas of the killing? Yes. Or... He painted it? Went... (laughs) He's no, that I old. Hadn't, I hadn't <laughs> thought about that, but yeah, he's kind of old. 
two, he went to the website for the fresco. <laughs> I think he probably went to see it in the intervening six months since it used to be his church. Yes. I think he probably said, hey, Ava, can you take me over there? I want to see it. it. It was under his church all the time when he was the reverend there. I think he went to see it. Kate complains about him being so fussy and cleanly. But I like that she's also open to just letting him clean. Like, yeah, if you like, want to clean it up, go ahead. Go ahead and clean it I'm up. I'm not going to stop you. Do I get a rent break? Well, it depends how good of a job you do. Nancy's a pretty good dead body here. She is. She's got the foam in her mouth and everything. Yep. And on the sackcloth, or sisal-based sackcloth. Sisal. Sisal-based. Yes. There is a fragment of a logo for SHC. Why does a homeless shelter have their own stamp on burlap bags? I don't know. Do you stamp sandbags to say this one's mine? Or if, you, if you're if you like a charity and you give sandbags out, do you brand them so people know where they came from? I guess. Maybe. That means that Shoreditch floods too, because that's where it is. Yeah. But I have a bigger problem. Mm. Okay. I've found this fresco. Mm-hmm. And in six months, I've not only created a website, but posters of said fresco. Mm -hmm. Does that not completely go against my brand? What like, do you mean? Like, if I can see the fresco on the website, why do I need to come there? Um, then why is the Louvre still in business? But the Louvre doesn't put every piece of art. Everybody's in. seen the Mona Lisa and millions of people go every year to see it. This... I think, I think it's different when you're actually in front of it. This is not the Mona Lisa. But... And they are woefully unprepared to receive guests. Oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but at some point, when everything's fixed up and the basement's waterproofed, I think there's there's importance to being in front of it, to actually seeing it. If I were religious, I think that would be important to me. The second problem I have is why does Reverend Gould have anything to do with the cops? He is the killer. Why does he call them up? Yeah, come over here so I can tell you Nancy was a goer. That'll throw you okay. off the scent. We knew she was a goer. <laughs> That'll confuse you. Did you see the name of his boat? Mia? Mo. Oh, Mo. Mo. Isn't there an umlaut or something? Something, but it, it's the me. <laughs> me. Me. It might not be his boat. Just because it's parked in front of his house on the canal doesn't mean it's his. He talks to Barnaby about all the reasons. Like, he's like basically confessing to Barnaby. Gould, at best, is delusional because of his cancer. At best. I don't think it's because of his cancer. I think he's somewhat delusional because he used to be very powerful in this village. Well, the, And at, he thinks he still is. So, so He's got righteous so, so vengeance at, on his mind. At best, it's delusions because of his cancer. It gets worse from there. Yeah. Delusions because of his own self-grandness. Adizing, uh, uh, yeah, you know what was he, that word? Self-aggrandizing. Okay, he 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 say I I will at least save one soul, dude, <laughs> at the cost of three. Wow. Can we go back to the boat for a second? Because okay. I've got a serious question. Okay. So this is there's a weir, right? That's where they find Nancy. Yes. And a weir is kind of like a dam, right? Yes. It's like an artificial waterfall in stages to slow water down, yes. right? Yeah. So how does that mean that boats that are above it have to stay above it and boats that are... I mean, you can't jump that in a boat, right? You can't go down it in a boat or up it in a boat. In, unless there's a lock over to the side that we can't see. There's got to be. It would seem like you have to choose well, upper think, weir or lower okay. weir for your boat. I agree, but the river that they find Nancy's body on is very different than the canal beside that house. Okay, you think? Do you think there's supposed to be two different parts of the river? I like think that part's two much, different parts. Like we're not I, supposed to be able to see the weir from his house. Like yeah. they're they're far apart. Yeah. Okay. Because he's really beside a canal, yeah. not a river. Okay, so it's just maybe different. Maybe it's a like a tributary where there's a lock. Maybe. I would assume that there had have to be a lock somewhere. Though I think those guys in the rescue launches would probably try to jump that weir. I think they do. They're on going a really of fast, <laughs> and they're in those inflatable boats. So if they bounce off of it, they'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we find out that Nancy was going to Australia because Nelson jumps in the flooded, fast-moving, probably undertow-filled river and gets her backpack from. A branch. I'm going to tell you, Charlie Nelson is the VIP of this episode. Yeah, he is. He finds the backpack. 
He's in shape too. He's in he shape. He runs. He, he fi- swims. He finds the red neckerchief and puts it all together. Mm-hmm. He is. He is on it. I like that he makes a reference to wild swimming. Yeah. So what's wild swimming? Ah, <laughs> uh, wild swimming is swimming not in a pool. Okay? Oh, okay. That's what wild swimming okay. is. Okay. I've done a lot of wild swimming. Um, the- it's become really big during the pandemic because the pools have been closed. Yes. And people want to go swimming. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of people have joined clubs. And so if you go to a lake and swim, you're wild swimming. That's okay. right. The Guardian had an article about it, and the title was "Wild Swimming." We used to just call it swimming. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't written by a fogey. It was written by like a Gen Y, Z or like somebody in their 30s. No, that makes sense that it's called wild swimming. But you don't have to use it that often. That's all. Right. But you wouldn't call it pool swimming. No. Or, or tame swimming. Tame swimming. <laughs> there's swimming and then there's tame swimming. But there's this big kind of, it's probably more popular now than it was when this episode was made. Yeah. Because of the pandemic and... See, most of my swimming I've done in my life... Is wild wild swimming. swimming. (laughs) But there's also a belief that because the water is cold, because we are talking about the UK... Yes. It's never balmy. No. That the shock of cold water can actually be good for you. I agree. Um, Having jumped into an ice bath of water... Well, you did the polar leaps. Polar leaps things. Yeah. But there's this, it's not been proven medically by any kind of rigorous study, but there's this belief that that cold water shock can actually be good for depression. And the the logic is that one form of stress, like the shock of cold water, can adapt your body for other kinds of stress, like the stress response associated with depression and anxiety. Okay. If it works for you, great. But that doesn't make any sense to me. That's like... Let me stab you so that you're better adapted to me shooting you later. (laughs) You're depressed. Do you want to drink from the fire hose? Yeah. (laughs) Like now that your body has gotten over one kind of panic, it'll be better prepared for a really different kind of panic. I don't know. But hey, if it helps you, that's awesome. Yeah. But it's not a panacea to cause all pandemic related mental distress. Though swimming in a lake does my body good. Mm-hmm. And my brain good. I know it does. So Frank has Nancy's car because Nancy wanted Frank to sell it. She's yeah. liquidating everything, she's, right? Because she's running off she's, to Australia. She's running around town to say goodbye to everybody. Well, mostly because the, she left her alcoholic, maybe abusive husband to hook up with this professor who turned out to be gay. And now she's like, Screw it. I'm out of here. I'm just leaving. I'm going to go start over again. I'm collecting all my debts. I'm selling all my stuff. So he has her car. What is he, what is he doing with it when he puts it in the ditch? Um, Is he trying to drive it to the council meeting? I think he's trying to drive it to the council meeting and then he either runs out of gas or it stops working. Why would he drive her car to the council meeting? Incredibly convenient. And I also have a heading in my notes that said, why is he driving her car to the council (laughs) meeting? Because he's definitely planning on being there. It's important to him. Yep. Like, it may as well be a stolen car because the police have been to his place. He had a chance to say, by the way... She left her car here for me to sell. It's right here. And he didn't. And he could have said that easy. So it's supposed to be on the down low, apparently. So let's drive it to the camp, to the parish meeting. In the middle of the night. (laughs) That council meeting. Wow. Mm. Should we wait on Frank? Nope. Nope. I'm like, that's not like any council meeting I've ever been. Did you think it was suspicious that Martha had Nancy's vote in a sealed envelope? I did. She didn't steam that open to see what it said? Uh, Of course she she did. I think she just made it. (laughs) (laughs) Nancy's dead. Like, when she heard Nancy was dead, she was like, uh, yeah, Nancy voted with me. I am Nancy. Signed, Nancy's vote. Yes. (laughs) Signed, pre-dead Nancy. Yeah. (laughs) She wrote it before she was dead. Look, it's pre-dead. That's evidence. Why are any of those people at the council meeting and why are they voting on, I guess... Selling like church em- property. Eminent domain kind of stuff? No, I think it's supposed to be that's the that was the vicar's house, so it was owned by the church, and they're going to sell it off. Okay, so let's get to motive here. The idea is that Ava is upset with the church because they're going to sell her father's house. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Every vicar I've ever known has a temporary mentality about the house where they live in if it's owned by the parish. Yes. But have you known vicars who are retired and still living in parish housing? No. Because I think I think the idea is once you're retired and they put you there, they're going to let you stay there the rest of your life. They're not going to kick you out when you have leukemia and you're 80. And it's not going to be the local person kicking you out. It's going to be the 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 bishop of that area or the archbishop of the diocese. That's my real problem with it is I don't think the parish council has the jurisdiction to solve that. I yeah. think it would be above above her pay grade. Yeah. Because that's an, a church asset. It's not a parish asset. Do you keep all our health documents in a giant folder labeled health documents? Yeah. Oh, okay. But not in a binder in the floor of my car. The binder. <laughs> Let's talk about Noah's big book of crazy. I'm going to go in a poxy caravan. <laughs> <laughs> so Noah and Ewan are always having this father-son fight about, I don't want to take over your stupid grocery store. Uh, yeah. and, oh, but son, I want you to take over the grocery store. You can put the apples in the baskets. I don't know what that accent is. And they have this like, <laughs> uh, son, uh, son uh, debate going on all the time. Yep. And then Noah leaves his messenger bag behind with the big book of evil in it. What is up with the big book of evil? I don't think it looks like an evil book at all. I think it looks like a typical medieval manuscript. They always had woodcuts that looked scary. Okay, let, let's do this story. Ewan runs the, the shop. Right. He's very proud of the shop. Yes. He wants to pass the shop on to his son. Yes. Who has gone to art school and is, Ugh. Ugh. okay, mm-hmm. that is the setup. Mm-hmm. He gets the book and is absolutely. F- he loses his nut. He loses his nut over the book. Assuming that Noah has never brought an art history ho- book home from university or before. Or that he's never seen an Full art of history. like naked ladies and stuff. There's the, the pictures of the fresco are, are as bad as what's in this book. Yeah. And then he, he hears his son being interrogated by the police. And he says, I loved him. I'm gay. I was in love with that man who was just murdered. Yes. We were going to be together. And dad comes in and goes, let's sell some stuff. I love you, son. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm glad you're not evil. I'm glad that that's there. <laughs> yes, but me the, too. The book stuff doesn't need to be he there. He overreacts to that book. The it's bo- not like his kid is doing satanic rituals or something. I actually did find the book. It's called God's Book of Red Herring. <laughs> I, I paused a God's lot. God's Giant Book of Red Herrings. <laughs> I, I paused a lot and I tried to read. There, there was a, a page heading, uh, like a running head at the top of a page that said, the light of nature and revelation. Oh. But that wasn't the name of the book. Oh. If it is, it's not a real book. There is a book on Amazon that has that title. It's not this book. Okay. No. No, oh, no. Okay. Stay away from that book. Oh, okay. It's a self-published book. Oh, that won't be in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to link to it. No. But these the woodcuts that are in the book are like, oh, look, there's Satan. There's Satan. Here's Satan. There's Satan. And I noticed one thing about the Satan in, the, in one of the woodcuts. He had a face on his tush. Yes, he does. He has butt face. Do you know about devil butt face? I, I do not know about the... <laughs> The Big Book of Red Herrings and Devil Butt Face. Oh, the Big Book of Red Herrings is one in a long line of religious texts that have devil butt face in them. Oh, do tell. As a matter of fact, I read an article about medieval depictions of devils and demons who have extraneous faces on their groins, knees, and butts. Oh, we'll link to that in the show notes. I'm passing Mark a piece of paper now that has some pictures. This is this is action on the podcast. Wow. These are but a few examples. That looks like a Muppet coming out of his butt. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to describe one of them? <laughs> okay. The, f- <laughs> the first picture, a... Red demon who looks like a cross between a demon and Homer Simpson, (laughs) who is easily, easily 15 feet tall. Yes, he's huge. Has a dragon butt face (laughs) coming out of his butt with horns and a snout like a pig and a tongue that looks like a snake coming out of his mouth. Yes. These will be in the show notes. 
Now I refer you to the one on the bottom right, which is the woodcut portrait. Yes. Can you tell what the demon is doing in that picture? Okay. I can only describe this picture as, does this butt face make me look fat? (laughs) (laughs) Because we have a young woman who is covering her ears. No, it's a morality tale about a woman who falls in love with her own reflection and is overly vain. So she's looking in a mirror, okay? Okay. And the demon is saying, how do you like this face? And he's got his butt cheeks spread. Yes. I, th- I think there's a little nut there. He's spreading his butt cheeks to reveal the face between them. Yes. To say, how do you like this face? <laughs> but he also looks like he's saying... Does my butt look big with this face on it? So the theory behind this is that uh, in Christianity, a good Christian's face is always up, aiming at God and the glory of God. And so someone whose face is down is fixated on hell and evilness. So devils have faces that face down. So they have to be position <laughs> this other picture the one to the left of it mm-hmm. which could only be titled that's not how you make butter yes <laughs> <laughs> has two demons tempting a poor woman who's trying to churn butter yeah and they both have crotch faces yes and knee faces yes and they're frolicking they're trying to, to tempt ca- her away to tempt from her, her chores away from her butter making. They want her to come dance with them. They're trying to tempt her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this this second one looks like a death metal band that has come to heaven. Yes. So across, across the top, you have the host of saints, and there's God and Jesus and a rainbow, and that's heaven. It's heavenly. Mm-hmm. Up there. And then below that is the band that has come to play heaven. Yeah, and they're called Devil Butt. <laughs> face butt devils face butt devils <laughs> FBD. one poor guy only has one horn in the middle of his head and he's got like male pattern baldness yes <laughs> well they're you know but they're he's an got, older band now he, he's got an axe <laughs> yeah you know he's ready to play and then the other guy the middle guy who looks about five feet taller than the rest of them has like cat demon for a crotch yes <sighs> They're often cats, cat faces for the, because there was this belief that if you were in league with the devil, you either had to kiss the second face of the devil or a cat's butt. (laughs) (laughs) Witches were thought to have kissed a cat's butt to seal their deal with the devil. These people had a real problem with oral sex. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, I just don't know what they were doing with cats. It's way out, but it's, it's a trope. Like it's a recognized image in religious texts so we have muppet demon butt the day the devil band went to georgia played heaven yeah uh that's not how you churn butter and does this butt face make me look fat <laughs> yes <laughs> and we will put these pictures in the show notes now give me my page of notes back <laughs> stop churning that butter sister the reason why i was looking at this though is that this last image that does this face on my butt make me look fat um is one of the woodcuts that's in the book oh it is yeah okay like those are all established images yeah okay they're they're yeah they're woodcuts like going back gutenberg time and so what what ewan gets all worked up about is nothing no it's nothing and the text around those images is like copy paste from the Bible. It's it's not like a Windows manual or anything. It's like they mocked those pages up. Whoever did that prop did a very good job. I'm sure they just replaced some pages in an existing book, but they did a really good job. It's convincing. There's a lot of ways to die in Midsummer, but the quickest way to die is to phone somebody up on a secret phone call and say, I have information about you. Yeah. Then hang up. Yeah. Because guess what? They're on their way over to kill you. Yes. <laughs> With your own front loader. Oh, can you... That, this is Why pretty... doesn't Frank run sideways? <laughs> Why doesn't he run sideways? I cannot get over it. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm blinded by these lights. I couldn't run sideways. Oh. Never mind if he just turned around and ran straight. They don't go fast. He could run away. He so could run away. If he just did like a little slide to the right. <laughs> You know, 
remember your line dancing class and just do a little slide to the right, he would not have been stoned. Because Reverend Gould would not have time to reload that front loader and go after him again. It's a one-shot deal. It's a one-shot deal. And he also says the victim language of, hey, who is that? Stop that. Get out of there. Yep. Oh, it's you. All that victim <laughs> yeah. language. <laughs> Which translates into, I'm about to die. He's also, the, Gould is also the worst killer in the world because he should have taken the phone. Yeah. Because he knew that he had a telephone call. Oh, it's just bad. I don't know that he really cares if he gets caught as long as Ava doesn't find out the truth. But if he gets caught, what's going to come out? Why did you do this? Arr, arr. Uh, the leukemia made me murderous. I, yeah. I mean, he could have lied about why he did it, yes. right? I'm just homicidal, but I'm not a bad dad. <laughs> Whatever you think. Sykes sits in a basket. Poor Sykes. He's like, oh, is this for me? Do I get to go for a ride? No. No, no, Sykes, you don't. Sorry, Sykes. So, uh, were you surprised that Barnaby had a, a VCR? Uh, no, no, no. Me I either. wasn't surprised at all. Frank gets stoned to death, mm -hmm. supposedly. That that's a horrible way to die. The way he dies, yeah. Though he could have stepped, slide to the right. Yep, get away. Um, and his dead body here is pretty good. He's got hand and water, and his face is on bricks. Well, and. Kate even says he would not have died immediately. Yeah. Like, he would have been buried and suffered and then bled out. Poor Frank. And I'm like, Kate's apartment's a mess. This yard is a mess. Oh, man. That's a lot of tetanus. Oh. Just surrounded by tetanus. Can we, um, can we jump to Hamilton's death? Okay. Why does he burn the book? I don't know why he's burning the book. Maybe. Because he associates it with Noah and he knows he messed up. Maybe he's burning the book because... He feels which, guilty? which I call here the gospel of the red herring. <laughs> <laughs> Why um, does he burn the gospel of the red herring? Maybe he feels that it's an anti-gay text and he wants to destroy it. Hmm. But I don't care if you're a professor of... Yeah, what is, would, Okay. He's an art historian. Okay, we're going to nerd out here on academia for a second. We've never done that before. Okay. 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 What, he, he's an art historian yep. professor? Yeah. Okay. Um, who's funding this research? I'm going to say he's on sabbatical and he has a grant. Does that solve everything? No. Who gave him the grant? Uh, English Heritage. Okay. Good? Okay. <laughs> because who's paying for that house? Even if he's renting that house. Uh, the house is part of the church. Still. So I think he gets it for free. Oh. Because they want him to restore the fresco. Okay. To preserve it. So we find out that Nancy put a bunch of health information on a memory stick. Yes. And gave it to Zach because she wanted his brother, who is a criminal. He's a criminal. He has committed a crime in the, the past crimes. to sell it on the dark web or something. The dark, the dark web. How much do you think that would have been worth? I ask because I know. I don't think health records are going to be worth a lot unless it's somebody important. How much do you think credit card information is worth? To somebody who's I would to say buy probably it. more because you could really ruin somebody's. Give life. me an estimate for one record. Hundred bucks. No. Okay. Five dollars. Five bucks. I can buy a credit card and ruin somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll... you can't get a specific person's credit card no, for no, five no. bucks. But if you buy like an info dump that somebody's hacked, it's about five bucks a record. Healthcare records, on the other hand, are worth about two hundred and fifty dollars each. Why are they worth so much more? Because they have so much more personal information in them. Okay. Multiple addresses. Yeah. Various health concerns you might have. Just think of how many different people could benefit in different ways. Yeah. Because it would not only have your birthday, social security number, insurance number, name, phone number, all that stuff that your credit card record might have, but it also has payment information, illness history, family history, all that stuff. A group called TrustWave who puts out reports about data theft. Yes. And that, those are 2018 numbers. Put those numbers out. There's no way Zach had enough saved up to pay her what that information was worth. No. $250 a record. No. And it's like scroll, 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 no. scroll, scroll. And there's no way. No. They go to confront Zach about this. Mm -hmm. And he does the... They, they have to have a name for this. Where when they go to see a suspect and he just takes off. Yeah. <laughs> we need to talk to you. No, you don't. Run. So... Zach Chase takes Cam. off. It, 
it is action chase cam. Yeah, they're like jumping over railings. The, ramps up and down. I've seen pictures of Midsummer Murders ca- cameramen. They are not ready for this. I'm sure they didn't do it all in one take. It is, it is a lot. And then Barnaby, the stunt driver. <laughs> he s- spins out in his Volvo. Ha! Yeah. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> That's not Barnaby in the car, of course. That well, would be a stunt driver. All he did was back up and spin. Yeah. Th- there'd still be a stunt he driver. He only goes 180 degrees. Yeah. Uh, stunt driver. Okay. Because remember, these people are insured, right? Yeah. The actors. Right. So they have to... It would have, be risky, right? What if he got out of control what and if they went into the, the canal car or, something? or something like that? Rolling the car on a flat piece of pavement? Yeah. Okay. So they find the memory stick. They figure out what Nancy was trying to do. She was just, you know, getting money to get... To Australia. She visited Martha, the Reverend yep. Martha. Yes. The night she died. But she didn't think to mention it. Martha didn't think to mention it. She didn't think to mention that she bribed her to vote to sell the Gould's house. She bribed her. Yeah. She paid Nancy money for her vote. She just puts it out there like just getting things done. It was expeditious. That is not a Christian thing to do. And then she's not going to get much money for the house because she's going to sell it to the professor for the cheap. So not e- like... It's not about... It's not... Well, she wants to raise money to waterproof the basement, but she also wants to keep Hamilton there. Your, your dastardly deed doesn't save you. She just dropped in to say goodbye and discuss minor issues. <laughs> Martha like, is not a good reverend. No. She may be a perfectly good entrepreneur. Yes. Not a very honest one. No. But she's a bad reverend. I don't trust that woman. They need the vicar of Dibley in there or something. Did you notice that in the Barnabys, they, the faucet is in every shot? Mm. They like love that faucet. In the lobster print on the wall. They love the pr- lobster print and that faucet. It's just like... Hey, we got this new faucet that we want to show off. So here it is in every single scene. Do you think on your most tired, deep sleeping nights, you could sleep through somebody putting shackles on your wrists and feet? No. I don't think I would I, either. I just... You'd have to drug me. I, There's no way I'd sleep through that. There, the only way he either has to be drugged or bludgeoned in town consciousness, which again, he would wake up for. And I don't think that we get a hint that either of those things have happened. He goes to sleep, he wakes up, and he's chained to his bed. I think big pointy chandelier above your bed is a bad idea. I would think the same thing. I'm just imagining you go, you rent an Airbnb to give you the little tour so you know where the keys are and where the coffee machine is. And you see like, what is that? A wagon wheel of death above your bed. What is that? Oh, don't you like the guillotine we have above the bed? Don't worry. It's very secure. Nothing will happen. You just have to flick this off here. I know that there's like a net of poisonous snakes above the bed, but they hardly ever fall out. Hardly, You're, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> it's very secure. The giant saw blade, if it swings down, it'll only get you if you're sitting up. It, it's fine. <laughs> the Airbnb and the pendulum. <laughs> I could not sleep in that bed looking up at that thing. God, no. The spike is long enough that it goes through his whole body, through the mattress, and out the bottom of the bed. It's like a 12-inch spike. It doesn't have to be there. No, it doesn't have to be there. It definitely doesn't have to be above the bed. No. And it's one of two. His place is like one big room, and there's another one over on the other side between the couches. Just when you need to impale somebody sitting in front of the fireplace, you're ready to go. I have another question. Okay. I hate to have questions like this. (laughs) <laughs> How did the old guy get the shackles? Where did he get them from? <sighs> How did Reverend Gould get the shackles I on don't him? I don't want to know where did about he get the shackles? Reverend Gould's private life. Yep. I'm just not going to think about it. La, 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 la. Maybe he borrowed them from Martha. It's very mousetrap. It is. It is. Yeah. There should be a guy diving in a tub. At first, I was like, Mousetrap, the, the, the play. The play. I was like, I don't remember that part of Mousetrap, the play. <laughs> it's a little grisly for uh, Agatha Christie. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not an ungrisly play. No. And this is the point in my notes where, so what is this episode about environmentally? Why is all the things happening? There's a flood. Okay. There's flood people and flood watchers. Yes. And flood and river people. Because there's been a lot of and rain the and the flood. river is rising. Okay. Now it's finally raining in the episode. I have to think that the director was like, I'm in England and I can't even make it rain. <laughs> 
because it's clearly fake rain. All in this episode, yeah. they control all the rain. But that rain. river is high. It is high. They, I don't know if they just <laughs> happened into it or if that <laughs> river always looks high and always has speedboats on it. Um, but you also have to remember that the worst flooding often happens a few days after a big rain. Yeah, it comes afterwards. Because that water has to trickle down from all the places it fell and collect in that body of water. But you know what the flood is good for? Hmm. It sure is good for that store. Yes. <laughs> There's a run on the local grocery store. You and Noah have to do fast business. To so this is There's one guy in that scene where they're all crowded around the counter who just has a basket of oranges and he's like clamoring to get to the register like I need my oranges. I'm going to put them up by the door so the flood waters don't come in. I don't want to die of scurvy if there's a flood. I need to buy these four oranges right now. Everybody else is going for the three bottles of vodka behind the counter. They should have just looted the place and left. When Ewan steps away from the counter with like the whole village there clamoring to buy stuff to go talk to they his son. They all should have left. They should have just walked out. Well, no. They, okay, so this is what happens. This is midsummer, remember? So they're all clamoring for their oranges and other veg, right? Yep. Then the cops come in. Yep. And they say, we need to talk to Noah. Yep. And... It's not in the episode, but there is a collective. Oh, so everyone's silent to listen. So, so they're all silent. They're all pressed up against the door of <laughs> the, the whole storeroom, village. The whole village, and then he says, "I'm gay, and I love that man," which is a really well done yep. scene. And, and they no all go, "Oh, oh, that's nice." And they look at Ewan, and Ewan knows, "I gotta go talk he, to my son. He's got to play the good card here." And they do a great job of not making this about uh, about Noah coming out. Right. It, it's just like, you're my son. I accept yep. you. Come on. I need your help. So Let's go. So Ewan goes in the back and everybody listens again. And then they Aww. all go. <laughs> and then when they come out, then they clamor again. I'm Because it's completely silent before. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I think that's exactly what they would have done. That's what we would have done. Yes. If we were there. Oh, absolutely. Listen. listen. Don't steal stuff. Just listen. He's gay. Of course he's gay. Everybody Everybody knew that. Did you see the way he was like, oh, all the time? The professor's gay? Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Wait wait, a minute. The professor's dead? (laughs) They already knew that. It's the village. It's the village. At Hamilton's place, when Barnaby's there, there's a Socko in the background in her blue paper suit. And all she does for the whole scene is pick up paperback books and shake them upside down (laughs) and put them down. And then she picks up another paperback and puts them down. And I looked and looked for any case in the real world where evidence had been found stuffed in a book and I couldn't find anything. Like, what were they, they looking for a receipt? Like where he bought the killer chandelier or something, I or I don't know. I, you know, the killer left a note, but they tucked it into the fourth paperback on the shelf, and they confessed to the crime. Shake it out; you never know what you're going to find. So, Marple and Poirot say, "Everybody, meet me at the church when the flood happens." Yeah, and, Victor and Stella and Gould starts to preach. They really should show. Victor knee deep in water with Stella on his shoulders, still wearing her pink hat. They both had their tabards on. Carrying a child. <laughs> and they've rescued one of the five children who live in the village based on the red dots on the map. But the flood is our fault. Ugh, this is where we know that Gould was a bad vicar. And like, okay. We brought this on ourselves because we're evil. On- you mean you are. You're projecting. Keep it to yourself, Rev. On the Reddits. Lately, there's been a thread on the Midsummer board about how religion is portrayed in the show. Which and it is a is, very interesting topic. It is problematic in some places. Mm-hmm. This, to me, though we have entrepreneur vicar yeah. and psychotic killer vicar, mm-hmm. is a positive episode because the people come together to help each other out in the flood because of the church. The community of the church is very positive. Yes. The leadership, not so no, much. No, no, But what the church represents to those people is tomato and cream of chicken soup and yes. coffee and tea and singing together and feeling safe someplace. Yes. And that is important. Mm-hmm. And that is... A, but a, it's not because of either of those vicars no. creating that community. I need the internet on this. 
<laughs> I need to Google right now. Like, Kate does such a good job of looking at him like, okay, oldie. I'll, I'm not tech support, but I'll do it. I'll shine my magic wand on the computer here and get the internet. Just connect to the internet. Like, <laughs> It's, it's, you know, MarthaWiFi.com or whatever. Yes. <laughs> if Martha set up her own Wi-Fi at the church, you'd have to pay to get on it. Yes. Yes, you would. What happened was the vicar Gould hadn't saved anybody. He found this poor woman in Taco Bell's parking lot giving birth. He's working at a homeless shelter in Shoreditch. Okay. Near that a has Taco a Bell. lot of homeless and drug addicted people who he thinks he cannot make a difference to. Okay. Then... A young woman comes in who's just given birth to a baby in the parking lot. You think it was the Taco Bell. I don't yes. even know if there is a Taco Bell in short. It's Tina Bell. So Her name's Tina Bell. Yes, yeah, Taco Bell. From somebody whose last name is Bell, I don't think you should be making fun of Tina. Anyway. Tina. Anyway. So he decides, if I can't help all these other people, I can help this baby wrapped in a dirty towel. Yes. So he steals her. His wife is already dead. His wife is dead. Tina's dead. No. Tina's not dead. No, no, not dead. when he takes no, no, the baby. No no, 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 no. But his wife has already died at that point. So it could. He's be, a single dad with a baby. It could be made the the argument could be made because of the death of his wife. He's been driven upset. Yep. And he steals this baby because of it. Yep. And then keeping her shortage, for twenty years. Yeah. Is not okay. Never having conscience, and she's more than twenty. He 25 is twenty-five years at least. He is a white slaver. He's a bad person. He's a horrible person. He's a child abductor. Yes. He absolutely is a child abductor. And he abductor. tells Ava, your mom died giving birth to you, so you'll never know her. Yeah. And then moves to Midsummer St. Clair as a widowed victor, vicar with a baby. And then, so Ava finds out that her mother didn't die when she was a baby. And there's a moment Has been of, looking for her for 20 years. A moment of hope. And then Barnaby's like, but she died for five years ago. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> like, oh, gosh. Stick that knife in and twist it right there. When they go in the church because of the flooding, what time of day is it? It's night. When they come out... It's the morning after the flood and Noah and his family precede them. <laughs> I, I just did notice there is a Noah character yes, in, in this the flood, flood episode. episode. Yeah. The clock on the church says 1.30. Oh. <laughs> they have not been in there that long. They've been in there all night. With the killer. And well into the next day. <laughs> with the killer. With the killer. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fresco's dripping oh, downstairs. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, not oh. only because Ava sprayed it with water, but because it's flooding everywhere. What is Ava trying to do when she destroys the fresco? I think she's trying to get retribution against Martha because they're kicking them out of their home because they want the money to preserve it. And she's like, screw this stupid old painting. You're ruining my dad's life for this stupid old painting. Yeah. So these are my notes but, in the morning after. But how does Ava feel after she's done that when she finds out her dad has killed a bunch of people? Like, sorry about the, the fresco. I'll help dry it off. Yep. <laughs> Let me put some paper towel on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this are my notes for the morning after. Sunshine. Three people dead. I feel for Tina. Mm, I still don't care. The end. <laughs> I wanted to know what Nelson was talking about. He's like, do you know what I found? What is it under her refrigerator or under so, the table or it, something? It's, it's in the couch or under the couch. It's something <laughs> under in the, the couch. Yeah. So this is, um, we're, we're putting out to the listeners. What was under Kate's couch? What was under Kate's couch? That put Nelson off. That you can say <laughs> comfortably. <laughs> It was one of those oranges from the grocery store. No, it was a devil with a butt for a face, face, butt, devil, butt, face, devil. Under the couch, just hanging out. It was a whole fresco. <laughs> Under the couch. Can you believe that? No, it was a fresca. Fresca. Mm. So, best corpse? <laughs> nice corpse. I'm going to say it's either Hamilton who does a good job underneath that thing, or Frank Dewar. Okay, it's best. It's not two out of three. You got to choose one. That's I, how it works. I'm going to go Frank because his hand is in water. There's a, He's lying on a bunch of bricks. It can't be comfortable. If he moved his hand even slightly, there would be ripples in that water. And Paul Copley, who plays Frank Dewar, is uh, an actor who's been in so many things. He's a well-established actor. Oh, totally. It's good, but he's not my favorite. I think Hamilton is better. 
Okay. Because he has to lay there looking like he's been impaled. Maybe that's what they found under Kate's couch. Hamilton impaled? Yeah. Under the couch? Maybe. It's a tall couch. Okay. After After the the credits. credits. Poor Zach. (laughs) Ava is not going to go out with him now. She's got some things to work through. (laughs) Ava has some difficult (laughs) issues to work through. She has... She's homeless. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. She doesn't know who her parents are. <laughs> nope. And now that the flood's done, her job is really... Back to normal. Back to normal. She's got some stuff to process. Yeah, she's not going to go out with Zach. She's not going to be ready to go out for a date. At least she's not the killer. No, no. She could have been just as easily. If I was the archbishop, I would want to be talking to Martha. Yeah, there'd be some conversation. And I think some people from this parish might bring it to his or her attention. Also, the inciting incident in this whole episode is he's sick, so they do DNA tests to see if she's a, a, a donor. Compatible for, to donate bone yeah, marrow. Would there have not been any other time in their entire lives that somebody would have found out that they were maybe not blood related? You look so much like your mother. Which one? <laughs> Yeah. Who are you talking about? Yeah, like... Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, in, unless unless she had been really ill and needed, you know, a kidney or something from him, I don't see why they ever would have... This is before 23 and me, you know, yeah. so... I'm hoping Noah and, and Ewan form a better bond, mm-hmm. and then maybe Noah and paint some signs to the store. <laughs> or maybe he can open a gallery upstairs or something. And I do help... Hope that Michael Dewar, because his life is also in ruins. Yeah, his dad's dead. His wife is dead. Yeah. Killed by the same person who used to be the vicar. If he needed a reason to drink. Yeah. I hope he gets some help. I do too. Definitely. Yeah, because he could be all right. What do Victor and Stella move on to next? What's the next public thing that they're working on? Oh, there's going to have to be a fate that needs to be organized. I'm sure they're I'm, behind that. I'm sure. I'm sure she's in the WI. Yes. So a bake sale. Something. To raise money for the for the fresco or something instead of making somebody homeless. Maybe. They'll find a cause. People like that always find something to get behind. You know I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't care, right? <laughs> And I, Do you know what he had for breakfast? Green tea. He, the man's a freak. <laughs> That's you're, not breakfast, to be fair. You're telling me. Nelson drinks. He gets up at six in the morning to run. My first comment was, why does he sleep in like that? That's not so early. But the green tea for breakfast after running? Yeah. It's not enough. Well, he's on the ball, so. Oh, that's Let Us Pray. What do we have up next? Well, you can find Midsummer Maniacs. No, what's our next episode? I'll get to it. Oh, okay. Twitter, Instagram, and email. Also on the Facebook groups for Midsummer and Acorn. Subreddit, as well as YouTube. Like and subscribe and hit the bell. Go also, to midsummermaniacs.transistor.fm and sign up for the newsletter. And I'm like- also going to ask you, please, and this helps us out almost the most, mm-hmm is if you can write reviews on Apple. Mm -hmm. We're not going to tell you how many stars to give us. Five stars. (laughs) Five. One, two, three, four, five stars. Give us an honest review on We just want more people to find the show who might like it. And more people will find the show. It's it's crazy that that's the one place where reviews actually matter, but they do. I think it's because Spotify doesn't have reviews. Yeah. So episode 98 is our next episode, season 16, number three, Wild Harvest. Which is about? The Celebrity Chefs episode. It's the one with the woman from Inspector Lindley. Nice. Who I don't like. So You're not supposed to. No. Just like you're not supposed to like Reverend Martha in this one. No. Oh, that's Let Us Pray. Okay, maniacs. Until next time. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Watch out for devils with face butts. (laughs) Butt faces. He's butt. Does his butt face make me look fat? <laughs> That's not how you churn butter. Come on, baby. Shake it with me instead. It's funny because Mark, uh, Mark had to print my notes because my computer doesn't seem to want to connect to our network printer. And he said, well, the pictures on the last page didn't print. Do you need those? And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to print that baby again because you got to see devil butt face. <laughs>